the Jason Ranch Show. Brian Tutsil again for Jason and the USS Connecticut, a Seawolf class attack, fast attack submarine based out of uh, Bangor, uh, which is now, it now has some acronym name, like whatever the South Puget Sound Naval something or other, but, but we, we know it as, as the Bangor uh, submarine base. Um, it, it collided with the Earth a, a few weeks ago. The, the Navy officially said it was a sea mount. And that it immediately it launched a thousand speculations. And the, the, you know, the assumption was, oh, it must have uh, been, uh, it must have rear-ended a Chinese submarine or, or something like that. And uh, it limped back to Guam. Uh, the, there's some pictures of the damage and pretty significant damage. And apparently the pointy end of a submarine is where uh, much of the business is done. And uh, so it, it's going to need extensive repairs. So <clears throat> how does that help the uh, families of the crew members there um, in, in Bangor? Now, you know, obviously, there is a lot of operational security about the movement of, of American submarines. And uh, they, if they know something, they can't reveal something. But is it heading back to Bangor? Well, uh, somebody I know who spent a, a, a few years in, in a submarine for the U.S. Navy, uh, was pointing out <clears throat> that that the most uh, capable dry dock, which is where it needs to go, is in Pearl Harbor, and that and that the facilities to repair this sub probably don't exist at Bangor, which, if you all recall the the history of Bangor, <clears throat> it, it was uh, originally just a ballistic missile base. And and it has that if you're if you're on the Hood Canal Bridge going eastbound, you you look to your right and you see that big barn, and that's where they physically you know put the missiles in the silos of the Ohio class ballistic missile subs, and by treaty, um, the tail of the sub has to jut out so that it can be counted by satellite. That's by treaty with the old Soviet Union, but so anyway now they you know they will base on the subs there now. But there's not a, a extensive repair facilities, so so the Navy is not confirming or denying this. But apparently, <clears throat> um, the crew it's going to go to Pearl Harbor, and then the crew is going to be flown back to the Puget Sound, and the sub is going to be repaired or something. But it's still a mystery about what what did it hit, and what I never considered because I I said yeah a sea mount, uh huh, and. And I, I, you know, I didn't buy that. And I'm like, well, if I was the Navy, I'd say, oh, it collided with a seamount, and not an underwater collision with a Chinese submarine or a Russian submarine or, or whatever. Well, the, um, a friend of mine with extensive experience in American submarines said, the bottom of the ocean is dynamic. And he said, yeah, if, if a volcano is erupting in La Palma, Spain, or Kilauea, in, in Hawaii, he said, you bet there there are mountains under sea that weren't there a year ago. That you know, they don't they don't check in at the front desk or something. Volcanoes are happening and volcanic activity is happening at the bottom of the sea constantly. That's that is how um, a terrain is made un, under the ocean, and that's how the Hawaiian Islands were made. Um, <clears throat> so so that was his explanation was because, because I I said you know I I don't know about you. But it seems to me that the floor of the ocean has been pretty well surveyed, has it not? And and he said, you would think that, wouldn't you? However, um, it's it's the old big sky little bullet theory. So, you know, big ocean, small boat. And these sea mounts just do come up. So they might be looking at a chart from maybe it's up to date five years ago or something. And then they literally they're sitting there going 10 knots submerged and all of a sudden boink you know the submarine is whatever it is uh 90, 000 tons whatever the hell it is you know and, and and so it has a lot of momentum did a lot of damage guys were injured and the whole thing but the navy's official story is it was a seamount like like i say i would if i were the navy i'm not going to tell the navy how to do their job how to navy down <clears throat> i would just say you might want to add a line to that and say natural phenomena of volcanoes erupting without calling us and telling us where they are is a very common thing throughout the world's oceans um, and uh, and that and, and also I mean if if you're unaware it's 
submarines don't run around banging away actively going ping 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 because one of one of the unspoken missions of a submarine is to be undetected and and you'll find that that shooting out active sonar like that gives up the ghost pretty quick and and so that's why the explanation is you know it's possible that the skipper is you know whoever the officer of the deck was is looking at a, a chart and it may be up to date and maybe 99.99 percent accurate but now there's a seam out there and and i said well why aren't they looking out the window and then he hung up on so there's a um so um I, i'm always leery about these kind of of surveys but what is i'll i'll, I'll okay Peyton, I'll, I'll i'll spoiler alert um one of the top 10 most expensive zip codes in america is in the seattle area yes um what would be your wild stab of what that would be what the actual zip code is well, no, the, i'll tell you the zip code is 98039 okay that's got to be medina right it's medina okay a couple of billionaires live there hey, you know what that's got, that, yeah too. that's got a that's got a salt the tip jar on that because i i would have said like you know poverty i mean i think mercer island is actually like two zip codes have you been to medina yeah so yeah i i used to work for like a sounders youth soccer camps i was a coach there we had one camp in medina every year and it was just always you know you heard every other soccer camp i would work you see you know soccer mom minivans and stuff this one had ferraris and and porsches dropping off oh, every yeah. single kid and there's a tesla every which way that you look at it, it, it was always a fun camp to gawk at some of the vehicles um <clears throat> yeah it's uh it, it's medina and and um and i don't know if have you ever been to Beaux Arts? You know, in that little, as you go south of Medina, there and and the shoreline kind of dips in, and you're staring straight at, straight at Mercer Island. There's that area called Beaux Arts. It was B E A U X, space arts. No, I've never oh, no. Google it. I, I yeah, I, I I had a friend who lived there for a while because he was rich AF, and uh, and 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 he got he just got tired of it and the neighbors and all that, but but. That was damn swanky back then, but Medina is, and you know, and also, <clears throat> I mean, you got you got to say, it, I mean, it, having having Bill Gates in your zip code probably helps. Uh, I'm assuming. I mean, and his house might straddle three zip codes. I don't know. But, it should. It's right there off the Overlake Golf Course. Yeah, you can see his driveway, but you don't see anything else because his house is so far off the road. The uh, the other ones are of course like Beverly Hills and Bel Air and all that, but um, but uh, the places the, that ninety percent of the population in the United States has heard of. No one's yeah. heard of Medina, outside yeah. of Washington. Yeah, and and it's and it's funny because the disparity uh, between the wealth of people that live in the Bel Air and Beverly Hills and all that, because California's done such a horrible job with the homeless, you in those neighborhoods there's people pooping on the sidewalks. Um, they like Calabasas too. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, and I, I forgot to pay off. Um, okay, so I played that audio that Lauren Bobbert um, said, where she's she's um, in, insulting, impugning, uh, if you will, Elon Omar from Minnesota, um, uh, talking about her marrying her her brother husband or whatever. Since the speaker has designated the floor to discuss members' inappropriate actions, shall we? The Jihad Squad member from Minnesota has paid her husband and not her brother husband, the other one. So, so there, her brother. So, Elon Omar um, from, the, you know, the squad, and she goes, she called it the Jihad Squad. <laughs> anyway, she, she replied, quote, Luckily, my dad raised me right. Otherwise, I might have gone to the floor to talk about this insurrectionist who sleeps with a pervert. I am grateful I was raised to be a decent human and not a deprived person who shamefully defecates and defiles the House of Representatives. Thank God, close quote. That's Elon Omar's response to uh, to Lauren Bobbert. So, um, <clears throat> message sent. We're waiting for the return to serve, madam. Um, you are up. Uh, all right, we'll uh, be back in a shake. Speaking of drugs and homeless, there's something in Seattle is really missing and it's so uh, what what is it that these people are on this isn't the fun meth of the early 2000s this is a new thing i'll tell you about it uh right after this it is jason rancho brian's filling in for jason
A big thanks to you for tuning in to the Jason Rant Show on demand. And a Jason today, tomorrow, and um, a little later on this hour, <clears throat> uh, Ron Vicello, uh, former deputy director and former acting director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, will join us um, talking about the uh, the record setting month for illegal aliens cro uh, uh, crossing the Rio Grande directly into uh, Texas and uh, the uh, <clears throat> the whole deal. Because it's on. Because, you know, nothing discourages people from coming to the United States, like um, claiming you won't get in, uh, yet people are inundated uh, with TV in Central America showing people just full-on crossing in broad daylight and not being sent back and, uh, and the whole thing. Um, and, and, yes, they do, they do send their kids. How come I know that? How do you know that, Radio's Brian? Well, here's the deal. Here is the deal. Um, where I live, far by the very northern edge of L.A. County. I'm way up at 4,000 feet, really beautiful trees. You know, it actually snows there, the whole thing. I'm so far north, Kevin McCarthy is my congressman, and he's he's out of Fresno. I mean, that's like your congressman being, you know, out of Bellingham, and you're far south. So so anyway, um, uh, California is inundated with illegal cartel marijuana grows because the licensing process in California to, to go legit is so complex and so burdensome, so onerous that most people have figured out, well, it was basically decriminalized before. Why not just keep selling it illegally? And so the cartels are in a big way to satisfy this demand um, for a couple, a couple of reasons. If you grow illegally in Washington or Oregon, if you grow whatever it is, more than more than six plants, whatever it is, you're you're in for a pretty hefty penalty in California. Yeah, no, not so much. And so you're fresh out of reason not to illegally grow marijuana. So <clears throat> some of these grows are industrial size and I'm, I'm not making it up um, in, in L.A. County. We finally got uh, a sheriff who gives a damn and and he has uh, they did this one giant bus. And I mean, it was literally 80 acres of greenhouses. I mean, that's how blatant and, and in your face they are. Um, well, who works at these cartel grows? Well, not the cartel guys. They're, you know, they're, they're too busy driving around in their bedazzled jeans and their chrome AKs and all this. Who works at all these illegal grows that are, by the way, tapping into the, the various aqueducts, which are the reason that we can flush our toilet? Um, so they, they get free water, um, and that's why they're, they're up uh, straddling the various aqueducts that, that water and hydrate Southern California. <clears throat> Who works on these, on these grows? Illegal aliens that are brought up from Texas. The cartels drive down there, and they say, um, hey, how'd you like to be a maid uh, at a hotel in Bakersfield or whatever? They, and then on the way up, they say, oh, that maid thing, that was to get you to get in the van. You're actually going to work at this forlorn, sun-beaten, illegal marijuana grow. You're not going to leave it. And in a couple months, we'll let you go. And not only are entire families brought up against their will, which is some call slavery, but children are. Because people from Honduras and Guatemala and southern Mexico are sending their kids up uh, with, with some coyotes or sometimes unaccompanied. Kids are all over working on these illegal grows. Are they murdered? We'll never know because we didn't know they came in the country in the first place. And uh, and, and if the cartel decides that uh, they don't want witnesses from this particular grow, of course they'll top them and just bury them out in the desert in the Antelope Valley. <clears throat> um, uh, so one day, the, the they started... Uh, chopping down the marijuana uh, a couple weeks ago when it started to turn, you know, freezing, right? So they don't need, you know, some of these slave labor kids, these human traffic kids. So one day, where, where I live, I live, in, it's dog heaven. It's 11 acres. It's, it's two acres by five and a half acres. Trees, everything. You know, my dogs, every morning, we're out. You know, the pandemic has been good to me. I've had this little fitness course and all this. So one day, the dogs are at the the far west end of the property and they're barking like crazy and i go see what they're barking at and there's about eight little people 
And I mean, I'm thinking they're like seven. And as they get closer, I'm looking, they're not. They're they're probably 14, 15, 16, but they're they're from the high, they're from Honduras or Guatemala. They're indigenous. And they're so indigenous, <clears throat> they don't even speak Spanish. Barely any Spanish. And I, I just said, you know, hola, buenos dias. And we start talk, I started talking to one female who, who had enough Spanish that, that I, you know, I'm, I'm saying, well, where are you coming from? She pointed up to the south end of the valley where I know there's a bunch of small marijuana grows and they did not speak Spanish. And she's talking to them in some Indian tongue and off they go. But I mean, they were bedraggled. They, they just had tattered hoodies on and, and grungy backpacks and all things. They had been working. They had been brought up as slave labor for a cartel grow. And a Daily Caller, the, the Ben Shapiro uh, project um, that, that he moved to Tennessee, uh, a, a good friend of mine is a journalist for Daily Caller. His name is Jorge Ventura. And he's from, he, he was born and raised in, this, in that area in where, where, where I live. He, he did about a two-month uh, investigation on these illegal grows and the slave labor and the whole thing. You can see it at carteldoc.com, C-A-R-T-E-L-D-O-C.com, or go to Daily Caller. I think it's up there now. He, he, went, to, he went to one um, <clears throat> bust of a, of a huge, huge marijuana grow. There were five Chinese nationals there that were brought up from Mexico. I mean, because the word is out. If you're missing out on this, the word, the word is out. You just got to fly to Mexico City and take a bus north, and then you walk in. These five guys were grabbed by a cartel and, and they said, um, yeah, you know, get in. Um, can you operate a water hose? A little block, because well, we have a bunch of those. Um, and, and so that was for me, not only, just like the state of Washington, not only did California absolutely screw the pooch on, on the entire academic year, you know, for a generation of kids, a year, you know, coming up on two years now, um, but they actively interfered with parents like me that, that wanted a, a, a solution um, or, or, or better distance learning and all that. And so, so we reached the, at that point, I reached the breaking point <clears throat> because I've got, I've got armed guys keeping child slaves at gunpoint to work on illegal marijuana grows. And they're only two miles from my house. And I live in a state that hates gun owners. I, I live in a county that hates them, in a state that hates them, that's run by a governor that hates them. And so I cannot, um, uh, uh, with confidence, arm myself for my own security for, for my own for my own house. And so that, that's the point where I'm like, okay, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm, cash me outside. I'm, I'm Gandhi. I'm out of here. That, that was the breaking point. And this is all because, and, and by the way, you know when this didn't happen? The four years prior to January 20th of this year. You know when I did not hear about cartels bringing slaves into America to work on illegal marijuana grows? Was uh, this little thing called uh, uh, 2020, and then uh, one called 2019 and 18 and, and 17. It wasn't happening because the ingredients that you need for, for the situation I just described are lax or unenforced laws. Check check there. Um, if, you're, if you're arrested for illegally growing marijuana in, in California, you will be out before the sun goes down. I guarantee. Okay, so check there. Um, cheap water or free water. Okay, check. As long as you're prepared to um, you know crack into an aqueduct. Uh, or steal a water truck, which, which they are. Okay, check. And what about free labor to make it really super profitable? Check there. It's walking in. It is absolutely walking in through the southern border. And and here's here. If I haven't depressed you enough, um, listen to this deal. Dig, dig if you will this picture. You remember during the Obama administration when the big caravan of kids came in and they didn't know what to do. And you know, same same with this. Right now, there's all these unaccompanied minors. They didn't know what to do. So remember, they set up FEMA camps, and one of them was at the Ventura, California naval base. And there were so many kids they didn't know 
And well, you know what they said? They said back then exactly what they're saying now, which is, well, we're releasing them to known relatives on <clears throat> and foster families and all that. That the, the bar to get a kid out was lowered back then so low that human traffickers were literally pulling up and taking young women out, signing them out, and then driving them up to crappy hotels all the way from from the grapevine and I-5 right up to Bellingham, all the way up I-5. Talk to, if any dirtbag truckers will admit to it, they were filling hotels with young girls um, and, and what they did, because because uh, I, I, I know some people in law enforcement that told me about this, what they did was they would pull up to the naval base, which t- temporarily a third of it was given to FEMA. They had all these kids, hundreds and hundreds of kids on bunks, and they would toss, they would look, at a, they would look in and find a teenage guy, 15, 16, throw him the cell phone, and then call, talk to him on the cell phone and say, hey, we're going get, to get you out of here, but you have to help us. Um, you need to look around in there and five, six or seven girls between 14 and 17, um, attractive as possible, and tell them that we have jobs for them as maids for rich Americans here in California. And then they go up to the FEMA desk and they say, ah, uh, yeah, my uncle is here or a family friend is here or, or whatever. That That's what happened back then. And FEMA was so embarrassed about it. They never talked about it. Well, the same thing is happening right now. And I mean, like I say, at the point I'm talking to kids that can't even speak Spanish, who have been slaves and and are only freed because they finally harvested the marijuana. You know, that's the point where I'm saying, let's back up and get the hell out of here while we can. Um, All right. uh, Speaking of backing up and getting the hell out of here, we'll be back with uh, Ron Vitiello, former uh, deputy director and acting director of Vice. Um, That more. It's the Jason Ranch Show. Brian Suits filling in today tomorrow. Welcome back to the Jason Ranch Show. Brian Suits filling in from Los Angeles uh, here on AM770 KTTH. And, uh, you know, if you just don't arrest them, then uh, the number of arrests goes down. That's what uh, CBS News is telling us as, uh, as, as arrests are going down on the U.S. border. But does that really mean that people are not still flooding across a virtually open border? Um, our guest, Ron Vitiello, a former deputy director and former acting director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, previously acting deputy commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, um, a lot of time uh, as a chief patrol agent for the Rio Grande Valley, also did his Vermont time. <laughs> so so uh, Ron Vitiello joins us. Ron, uh, thanks for coming on uh, the Jason Ranch Show. But I'm Brian. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Brian. Um, you know, being, being close to the, to the issue here in LA, um, I, I, you know, like, I, I get an impact from it, but, but, um, can, can you characterize for us, uh, the, the, the nature of what happens when, when people who are not arrested, uh, uh, uh cross that border? Because here, here in LA, two guys were just convicted for driving vans to Texas, filling them with people, bringing them back to houses that they were squatting in and then handing the phone to all these guys and telling them, call your relatives because we need 20,000 bucks from you and from him and him and him and him and him. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's part of the side effect, but, but, but um, just d- describe the, the nature of, of what happens when, when people cross over illegally. Well, it's like any other crime. If, if, the, if the police don't enforce the law, then people are not, there, there's no consequence to committing a crime. So if you let people come to the border, not, and now in the situation where you've got more than 40% of the border patrol doing the care and comfort and processing mission versus patrolling that border, the likelihood of you being arrested at the border is quite low, right? You've got a, you got a better than 40% chance of, of escaping without detection. And then many of the people who are caught and detained uh, have young children with them, and all the children that are alone are being released. And so what that does is it encourages them to when they settle in places like Los Angeles, where you are, or Seattle, or Dallas, Texas, that they call home and they tell all of their friends and relatives that we've gone soft. The Americans have gone soft at the border. If you're going to come, now is the time. Uh, we've also doubled down on the policy side and told ICE they can't arrest people who are not crossing the border immediately. Uh, they're not convicted aggravated felons or a threat to public safety. So if you're in the country illegally just because you're illegal, they're, they're prohibited from approaching you uh, as an ICE office. And then we're talking 
rhetorically about giving amnesty to every person that's in the country illegally. And so we've encouraged everybody that's in the third world and or near the third world uh, to come because you know we've gone soft at the border. And, and, and it's funny because the president and the vice president are absolutely mystified. They, they literally are denying that if the word gets out that, you know, if they arrest you, you get a yellow ticket, a notice to appear. If you don't appear, they don't come find you. If you do appear and they and they don't uh, give you asylum, they still don't deport you. I mean, they're they're d- denying that that is a magnet. I mean, in your years of experience actually on that border, um, how how much is I mean, in other words, is there a rat line? Does the word get out? Uh, hey, Trump isn't president anymore. You cross. They give you water, and and that's that. I mean, that really boils down to the villages. Yeah, well, people see with their own eyes what, what's happening on the border. We saw the, the nearly 15,000 Haitian migrants that you know were on the ground in a shanty town inside of the United States. Uh, the following weekend, the secretary went on television and, and was encouraged by how many of them had been released into the United States with a notice to appear. And, and you, you think that they are not going to tell everybody that they know that wants to come here? Uh, now is the time because it's, it's the, you know, believe what you see with your own eyes. But despite what people are saying about why this is happening, it's all about the policy. Um, we've reinstituted what, what we used to call a catch and release problem. This isn't the first surge that the department has seen. It's the worst ever. It's the worst in the history of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but there was a surge in 2014. It was ended under the Obama-Biden administration by using detention to hold people until they had their fair due process hearing in immigration court. It, the 2020 surge was ended when, when Mexico stepped up and helped us, and we instituted the Remain in Mexico policy, which allowed people, again, to have their due process in immigration court. But instead of being released in the United States as they are today, they, they were allowed to wait in Mexico until those hearing dates were posted. Um, <clears throat> U.S. officials, are, there's a three-way policy um, get-together today with Canada and Mexico. U.S. officials have said border policy will not be even brought up. So, so what does that tell you about the priority of this administration and the border, Ron? Well, obviously they don't care to fix this problem. And, you know, Mexico did a lot under the last administration because they were essentially were threatened with, with sanctions and, and a deterioration of the NAFTA accords. And now, now why would they help us? Our own policy is encouraging people to come here. Why would Mexico step up to try to help us secure that border? Yeah. Uh, they never did before in, in, until they were sort of forced into it. Uh, and now they, they would be laughing at, at the request uh, because our policy is, is encouraging this flow. And let, let me just say that, you know, the people who were in that pipeline, uh, you, you talked about these people that were uh, – uh, kidnapped uh, in your area. That that happens all throughout the pipeline. These people are taken advantage yeah, of by corrupt governments and officials. Um, all right, Ron Vitello, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're up against a hard break. Uh, sorry to, to cut you off short. This is the uh, Jason Ranch Show. Brian Suits um, in here. When we come back, the U.S. Connecticut coming back to banger? Question mark. That-